All right, First John chapter 5. I, I want to just uh, start talking about the, today the topic of assurance of salvation, um, how we can know that we're saved. So it, it's quite an in-depth um, topic. Uh, I thought I'd give you a couple of things to think on today um, of why I believe a person can know that they're saved. Um, but we read here in 1 John chapter 5, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. So that phrase there, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, this is the scripture that we really turn to, to say, hey, a person can, can know that they have eternal life. Um, and... You know, one thing I sort of would ask myself is, you know, why does the Word of God say that we can know that we have eternal life when, you know, eternal life is by faith? You know, how can you know you have something when you only believe you have it? Um, if we go to uh, Hebrews 11, we see there the definition of faith. You know, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So how do you know you have something if you haven't seen it? Because faith is the substance of that thing that is not seen. It's the evidence of the thing not seen. So when, how do you prove something that you can't see? The Bible's saying here that the only evidence you have of something that you can't see is faith, is the fact that you believe that it exists, or you're, I guess you're told that it, it, that it exists, even though you haven't seen it. And you believe then that it does exist based on what you've been told and not by what you've seen with your own eyes. Now, you know, an agnostic, you know, somebody that basically, you know, believes that you can't know, you know, that you don't know, they, you know, they, they accept nothing, reject everything, would say, you know, you can't know. You know, the Bible says you can know you have eternal life. But they'll say, but you can't know. You can't know that you have eternal life. You, you just believe that you have eternal life. So, you know, what do, exactly does this phrase mean when it says that we know that we have eternal life? Well, uh, you know, I've got some thoughts on it this morning, but, you know, I don't believe that when it says here that you can know that you have eternal life, that we know in the scientifically observable sense. Because, you know, if, if we could see it, then it would no longer be faith. So it, I don't think it's no in that sense. And that's how we would use the word today. If we say, I know something, it means you've seen it with your own eyes. You, you've observed it scientifically in the sense that you can observe it, you can test it, you can repeat it, and you know um, what you're looking at. Basically, you know by, by sight and not by faith. But, you know, there are some theories, you know, some theories, you know, when you have a theory, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know like basically an explanation of some facts, some theories can be made to look more reasonable or less reasonable based on, um, you know, scientific observation, which means, you, you know, you can actually see it, you can actually test it. But what we have to understand is it, that scientific observation doesn't ultimately prove some theories. And some, for example, some theories would be, you know, the existence of a divine being. You know, you can scientifically observe things and it could make that theory of that divine being more reasonable or less reasonable, but it doesn't ultimately prove that that divine being exists. Um, another example would be, you know, origins, how the world was created. You know, we can have a theory of how the world was created. You know, you, you have evolution and then you have, you know, divine creation. But even though we can, we can observe evidence in this world, it doesn't ultimately prove uh, one theory or another. It just makes a theory more reasonable or less reasonable. What are some other examples? You know, historical events. Because we can't go back in a time machine and actually observe what happened in the past, and this is, you know, the same point as, as creation because it's a historical event, but even to do with civilizations. I mean, just because they dig up some pots, they, they see some paintings, you know, it can lead you to have a, a reasonable conclusion about why, what you believe about that civilization, but... Does it ultimately prove that that theory is correct? No, you have to believe um, that theory. It can make it more reasonable or less reasonable, but doesn't ultimately prove it. And a couple of other examples would be, you know, miracles that happened in the past. Um, the spiritual realm, 
You know, you can have evidence or you can, you can interpret facts to make, you know, the spiritual realm more reasonable. You know, the fact that a lot of people believe it. You know, that's a fact. But does that prove that the spiritual realm exists? Well, no. But does it not? Does it prove that the spiritual realm doesn't exist? It doesn't do it either way. So, you know, the spiritual realm, uh, it's the same with future events, things that are going to happen in the future. Um, and also things that happen after you die, which is a, a future event. So there are some examples of theories that people can have, and scientific observation doesn't uh, prove or disprove them. It can only make them seem more reasonable or less reasonable, um, depending on how much scientific observation there is. And you know, this is why, you know, so, so, why, so that, that's why they can't be proven, because they can't be proven because they can't be observed in order to be tested. So that's why, you know, we have to be careful when we watch, you know, a lot of documentaries out there. Because you know there are documentaries on history, you know, ancient civilizations. Um, and there are documentaries on astronomy. And, and the, the big one, I think, where they take the most liberties is, is astronomy and also archaeology. Because you ever wonder, you, you watch these documentaries, for example, on astronomy, and it's almost like this camera is like flying through space, and it's showing you what these stars look like, and what these galaxies look like, and you're like, whoa, is that what the universe looks like? But you've got to remember, they have no idea that that's what this looks like. You know, they look into the sky, and they see dots of light, and all they see is the color of the light, and, and things like that, and then they come to all these conclusions based on, you know, what they believe about physics, and what they believe about things like that, and, you know, are, are they right? Maybe. But the point I'm trying to make is, is when they fly this camera, this you know, 3D image around the universe showing you what this distant galaxy looks like, I mean, obviously they, they haven't seen it. They just believe that's what it looks like. Um, and they're just trying to, to make a reasonable assumption. But we just got to understand that they, they don't know. All they see is the light. And you know, even with documentaries on dinosaurs, I mean, think about it. They dig up bones but then they're going to tell you the, the breeding habits of this animal. They're going to tell you like what this animal sounded like. I mean, how can they even know that? And it just goes to prove that a lot of these documentaries on so-called science are not actually science. They're not actually something that they've observed and tested. It's all just uh, belief and theory. But anyway, so, so even though we say, okay, we can't know in the scientifically observable sense, then the, the agnostic might say, well, there you go. Then you, then you can't know, right? So is, you, you, you're basically admitting that you can't know. Then isn't it then the most reasonable assumption then to believe that you can't know? Well, I'll give that to them. I'll give that to them that we can't know in the scientific sense. But just because we can't prove it scientifically, does it then mean that it's the most reasonable position to believe that a theory is false? Well, not exactly. Now, I don't have a perfect understanding of agnosticism, but you know, as far as I understand, agnosticism in my eyes, it seems as though it's a religion of ignorance. Basically, it's, it's a religion, it's a, it's a, it, and the reason why I call it a religion is because even though you can prove that you don't know the answer, you, you can't prove that nobody knows the answer. So even though you can say, I don't know, you don't know that nobody knows. So there might be the truth out there that somebody knows and maybe you just don't know. So taking the position that you don't know and you're fine with that position is still a position of faith because you may be believing the wrong thing about something else that somebody does know. I don't know if I'm making sense there. But you know, basically it's a religion of ignorance because even though there are these multiple theories out there, what an agnostic will do is they will basically reject any theory out there and they would rather take a position of I don't know, a position of ignorance, and reject any uh, theory that is thrown at them. So basically it's a, uh, what, I, what I understand, it's a reject everything and accept nothing. That's their position. So even though they claim to believe nothing, you know, I believe that rejection is still a position of faith. Because, you, because they cannot know that the claims of Christ are false or true, if they reject it, they have taken a position. Because they've taken a position that that position is false. Because if they take the position that it's true, they would accept it. You see? So it's still a position of faith, even though they claim to believe, oh, you know, an agnostic will say, no, I don't have a religion. I don't have a faith. I don't believe anything. 
but when you think about it, it is a position of faith. Is it, it is a position of faith that they have to come to because they don't even know that they don't know. I mean, if, they don't, if you don't know anything, how can you even know that the right position is to not know anything? So it, it starts to sort of mess with your brain a bit, uh, trying to reason this out. And let me, let me give you an example, though, of why even though you can say, well, just because we can't know scientifically, does it mean then that the most reasonable, reasonable position to take is that we don't know? So let me give you an example. Uh, you know, let's say you have a painting, right? And you, you have a painting of the Mona Lisa. Now, evolution would say, well, after millions of years, somehow this paint, you know, uh, fell onto this canvas and, and turned into this picture of this woman that we see. And we can see, well, that's a totally unreasonable explanation of how that painting came about. But you see, what an agnostic will do Oh, what, 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 what I guess what a creationist would do is they would look at that painting and they'd say, man, there's no way that this came about by chance, random processes. Somebody obviously must have painted this painting because we can see that there's the hand of intelligence behind it. And even though I can't prove to you that a painter exists and, you know, yeah, we can see that somebody's painting a painting here, but that doesn't mean that this painting was painted by somebody. We have a reasonable basis for why we believe that a painter exists to paint that painting. Now what an agnostic would do in that situation is that they would look at the painting and they'd say, well maybe there's a painter, maybe there isn't a painter, I don't know. You know, we don't know whether there's a painter or not. Now to me that is an unreasonable conclusion because if I can see the, the hand of an intelligence in it, I can see design, I can see that it can't happen by chance, Somebody must have painted that painting. So to me, the more reasonable uh, conclusion is that there is a painter, even though I can't prove to you that the painter exists, that I ultimately cannot scientifically observe this painter, it's still more reasonable for me to believe that there is a painter. And I think when you start looking into the Bible, start looking into the events surrounding the Bible, start looking into the claims of the Bible, to me it's, it's, it's more reasonable to accept that the Bible is the result of a, of a supernatural being than it is to take the position, well, I just don't know where the Bible came about. Because in order to, to take that position, you would have to reject the claims of the Bible. You would have to reject the Bible for what it is. And I think it would be harder to take that position than it would be to uh, take the, just accept the position that the Bible is true. So I won't go really into that today, but you know, just, just to say this, that the debate um, of which, th the debate really is around which theory is the most plausible. The debate, and I'm sort of mentioning this, um, I can't remember whether it was last sermon or the sermon before, the debate is not about who has the most evidence, because we all, in that scenario, we all have that painting to look at. The discussion is about who has the most reasonable or plausible explanation for the facts we can see. And this has to include the fact that other points of views exist. And this is why it's hard for me to accept a view that says all views are equal or all views are the same because that view is not reasonable in light of the fact that there are other views like Christianity saying that Jesus is the way, the truth and life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me, um, that there is only one truth and that not, not everything can be true. So that's what the debate is about. And obviously as Christians, you know, we believe and defend that the Bible is the word of God. And it is the theory um, that has the most reasonable explanation. So, okay, so we say, all right, so we don't know in the scientifically observable sense. That's not the claim that this verse is trying to say. I believe it's trying to say that we can know or that we can have assurance that we have eternal life if we believe the Bible is the Word of God. So on the basis that we believe that the Bible is the Word of God, we can know that we're going to heaven. Why? How do I know that I have eternal life? Well, here's uh, uh, three things to consider. Let's just go to 1 John 2. So anyways, I hope I made sense in that sort of explanation there. In 1 John 2, 25, it says here, And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. So the first thing to consider is that why can we know that we have eternal life? Because God has promised it to us. 
Um, and you know, there are many promises in the Bible. I mean, just going through the promises in John, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, John 5, 24, uh, he that uh, heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. There's that promise there. And uh, shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And you know, one that we all love is John 6, 47. Verily, verily. So truly, true. I mean, Jesus is already making a statement of promise and he backs that up by saying, you know, verily, verily, basically emphasizing the fact that he's telling you the truth here. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that, uh, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So these are all promises from God that we have everlasting life. And you know what some people will say? They'll say that, you know, the gospel uh, of faith or believing on Jesus Christ to be saved was just a teaching of Paul. And that Christians that, you know, just believe that you just have to believe and be saved are just following the teachings of Paul. But how many times does John say that, you know, he's promised us eternal life, we believe we have everlasting life. And so it, it just goes to show that, you know, this message that believing on Jesus Christ is not just a teaching of Paul, it's a teaching of the apostles. I mean, how much more inner circle do you get than the apostle John, the one that leaned on Jesus' breast at dinner, the one, the one of the three that went up with him to the Mount of Transfiguration and, and saw him transfigured? So it's not just the teachings of Paul, it's the teachings of all the apostles. They, they even supported the, t the writings of Paul. And you kind of think to yourself, well, if God has promised eternal life, and that's not good enough for you, and my sermon's not going to end here, but you know, if God has promised you eternal life and that's not good enough for you, then, then it begs the question, then what can be good enough for you? Right? I mean, most of you here, you know that, well, you believe, you, don't know, you believe that my name is Victor. But how many of you have seen my birth certificate? So you believe that my name is Victor and that's good enough for you, right? But, but I'm capable of lying. You know, what if my name isn't Victor? What if my name is, is, is Barry or something like that? Um, but that's good enough. You accept a promise from a man, but yet you doubt a promise from God. So my point there is, is if God's promise is not good enough for you, you know, what possibly could be good enough for you? Um, let's look at a couple of verses just in regards to this. But in Luke 16, we see there the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man goes to hell. And in verse 27, he says, Therefore he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren. So this is him crying out from hell. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them lest they also come into this place of torment. Now, I just forgot to mention in my last sermon, because um, I was just thinking when we were talking about the baptism for the dead and being able to get people baptized who are burning in hell. And, it, and I just wanted to, I wanted to bring you to this passage, but I forgot to, and say, you know, with the rich man burning in hell, why did he request for somebody to go preach his brethren the gospel? Why didn't he just say, send somebody to go get baptized for me? Yeah. Well, he didn't, right? Because that's not what's going to get him out of hell. Well, that, well, that's not what gets you out of hell. See, what he's begging for here, he knows that he, he cannot get out of hell. And that's why what he's begging for here is for somebody else to tell his brethren that they won't come to hell where he is. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. So this is the, the promises of God, the word of God. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So what is he saying here? If they don't hear if they don't believe the word of God, they're not even going to believe somebody, even if they rose from the dead, to tell them um, about the afterlife, about heaven and hell. And I see that same principle here in this passage is if God's word is not enough for you to give you assurance, then I don't believe anything can give you assurance. How can man's word give you assurance if God's word uh, doesn't give you assurance? But we know that man's word does give you assurance in some things. Even though man can lie to you, you believe man. 
Why do you find it hard to trust and believe God uh, when he tells you something? Um, we see here, and we've gone to this passage before, but let's go to 2 Peter 1. <coughs> Verse 17, or verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. So these are stories concocted by men that are not true. We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So we saw him with our own eyes, he's saying. For he received from God the Father honour and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice, so this, this voice that they heard, this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So Peter is saying here, we were there on the Mount of Transfiguration. We saw Jesus transfigured with our own eyes. We heard the voice from heaven. But then he goes on to say, but we have also a more sure word of prophecy Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So we see there that the Scripture, the Word of God, the promises of God, are more sure than even your own experience. They heard it, they saw it, but Peter is saying that the word of God is more sure. So the word of God to, to us should be more sure than our own experience. It should be more sure than even the testimony of another man. And yet we accept those things above God. Why can we not accept uh, the promises of God when he promises us eternal life? So number one, not only are we promised eternal life, but what makes God's promises different to a promise from man. And I sort of sorry, already alluded to it, but I'll just um, show you a couple of verses. <clears throat> in Titus 1-2, it says here, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So what makes God's promises different to a promise from man? Well, it's the fact that God cannot lie. Because if God can lie then how can his promise be 100%? And I sort of alluded to that when I said to you, you know, I'm telling you my name is Victor, but the fact that I'm capable of lying, you can never have 100% assurance of that because, because I am capable of lying. You can reasonably assume that I'm not telling you the truth, but when God cannot lie, uh, we have 100% assurance that we have eternal life because if we don't, when we believe on Jesus Christ, it would make God a liar. Uh, look at this verse here in Numbers 23. Verse 19, it says here, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? So it's saying here that once God says that he's going to do something, he's going to do it because he can't lie, just like we saw in Titus 1-2. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Now you might read that and a lot of people will say, well, isn't that a contradiction? Because if God doesn't repent, don't we read all through the Old Testament that God repented? Um, but we have to read the word repent in context because remember, repent has a single meaning, but it has to be used in context with something else because you need to repent of something. So what does it mean here when it says that, uh, that God will not repent? Well, it's meaning here that he doesn't say something and then he doesn't not do it and make himself a liar because oftentimes he repented in the bible because he was you know you know i don't have a hundred percent understanding of this but what i understand is is that he will judge somebody so he'll send a curse on them or he'll, he'll do something bad to them but it was generally conditional upon whether or not they would turn they would turn from their sins so like nineveh he sent jonah to preach unto them that nineveh would be destroyed but if they turned God then repented of the evil that he said he would do unto them, and he did it not. So he wasn't lying in that sense, because generally the judgment of God in the Old Testament was conditional upon turning from their sins, um, that he would not send that judgment to them. So why does it say here that he will not repent? Because he's made a statement, 
that he will bless Israel in this statement in Numbers 23 with, with Balaam. And it's saying that he isn't lying about that blessing. If he says he's going to bless, he will bless and he won't repent from it. He won't make himself a liar. So, you know, does God repent? Yes, he does. But he doesn't repent if that means he's going to lie. And that's why if he's promised eternal life, he can't repent of that because if he does, it would make him a liar. That's why the Bible says in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Because what, you know, what good is a promise if it, if it can be broken? You know, if I promise to give you a hundred bucks and, and I don't keep that promise, well, what good is that promise to you? But if I promise to you that I'm going to give you a hundred bucks and I'm not capable of lying, um, then, then you can know for sure that you have that hundred dollars because, because I'm ca not capable of lying, you will get that hundred dollars. Now, not only that, so God has promised it to us, number one. Number two, you know, God has promised it to us and he can't lie. But the last thing I want to show you as well is in Hebrews 6. Let me just show you these passages here. Let's read Hebrews 6 verses uh, 13 and onwards. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, that we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon this hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, what's the third point I want to make here? Now, in verse 13, it says, well, in verse... Um, uh, 16 it says for men verily swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath so not only has God promised it to us not only can God not lie but then God then confirms his promise to us by making an oath uh, and what does it say here in verse 16? It says, For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. It's basically saying there that when two men have an agreement, if one then makes an oath, it basically settles it. It basically says, you know, this, this is something that is going to happen because they've made an oath by something greater. Now, God cannot swear by anything greater because he is the greatest. So what does he do? He swears it by himself. It says, verse 17, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the earth. So he's, he's, he's so willing to prove to us that his promise is true and that he cannot lie, confirms, confirms it by an oath. It says the promise uh, unto the heirs, the promise, uh, sorry, unto the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel, that by two immutable things. Now what does immutable mean? It means that it cannot change. If you think of the word mutant, right? Like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. They change from being turtles into ninjas. Now, when it says here the immutability of his counsel, it means something that he says, his counsel, it cannot be changed. It's immutable. That by two immutable things. So what are the two immutable things? Well, one is his counsel, his word, that he cannot lie. The second immutable thing is his oath that cannot be broken. Uh, in which it was impossible for God to lie. So there we see again the second point, which the promise that God made that he cannot lie. We might have a strong consolation. So there's that comfort there, that assurance, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. So why does the Bible say that we can know that we have eternal life? Because if we believe on Jesus Christ, we have that promise. We have a promise from God that he cannot lie. And not only that, God has made an oath to, to show that his promise will be kept. 
Now, look at these couple of verses here in um, Deuteronomy. Verse 23, verse, uh, chapter 23, verse 21. Look what it says here. When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God. Now isn't that what God has done? He's vowed a vow to himself because he could swear by no greater. He swear by himself. When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it. For the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee and it would be sin in thee. So it's saying there that if you vow a vow and you don't keep it, it's going to be sin. Now, God doesn't have any sin. So if God makes a vow and he breaks it, he's sinning. But we know that the Bible says in Hebrews 4 that, you know, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all point tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So God doesn't have any sin. That's why if he, if he makes a vow, he's not going to break it. Uh, look at this verse in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 4. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it for he hath no pleasure in fools pay that which thou hast vowed better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay and you know we live in a day where marriage vows get broken left right and center you know what one in three people you know whether you're christian or not they say or even christians or people claiming to be christians are getting divorced they're breaking that vow you know maybe people that are going to make that marriage, marriage vow need to take a look at verses like this and really consider the covenant that they're entering. The Bible says it's better that you should not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Because not only is it sin, because that vow and you, and you bring children into the equation, when you break that vow, you can cause a lot of heartache. You can cause a lot of problems to innocent um, children. So what's the conclusion here? Let's, so with that in mind, let's go back to 1 John. 1 John. Verse 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, so this is what I allude to, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. So this is the witness, this is the testimony, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son of life, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So with that in mind, the passage talking about the witness of God, the promise of God, the witness of the Holy Spirit, three bearing record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. The record is that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Then it concludes with verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So it's not that we know in the scientifically observable sense, but it's the fact that God has promised it to us, that God cannot lie, that God has sworn it with an oath, that if you believe on the word of God, you are sure to have eternal life. Not because a man has promised it to you, but because God has promised it to you. So we are assured of eternal life uh, by a promise, number one, not by scientific observation. You know, number two, the promise is from a God that cannot lie. You know, he's confirmed it with an oath and he can't sin. And number three, that promise is conditional upon faith, isn't it? It's conditional upon faith. And how can we know that we have eternal life? Because we know whether or not we believe. Because we know we believe, we know that those promises uh, apply to us. You know, and people get this idea, and I'm not really going to go into it today. I'm going to finish here. But you know, people get this idea that the basis of our salvation is a different basis to the basis of assurance. But it's not. And sometimes we talk about them 
for, as two different topics, but really they're just two different angles of the same topic. That's why I'm going through, when I go through this, it's pretty much the same stuff. It's not by works, it's by faith. Um, so, you know, people get this idea that you know, the basis of assurance is different to the basis of salvation, but it's not. They're one and the same thing. You know, you can't be saved by works. That's why any assurance that is based on works is not assurance. Because you didn't get saved by works, how could you possibly look to your works to see whether you've accepted salvation? Because you didn't accept it by works. So works cannot give you assurance at all. You know, it's the same with a feeling or an emotion. You know, it wasn't a feeling or an emotion that got you saved. It was a decision to believe on Jesus Christ. It was your faith. That's why people that look to their feelings or their emotions for assurance of salvation, you won't find it there. Because you can't look to your feelings and your emotions to see whether or not you've accepted eternal life. The one thing that you can look to to see if you've accepted eternal life is your faith. Because in order to accept eternal life, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you can look to that and have full assurance that you have eternal life because you need to believe to have eternal life and you know 100% sure that you've believed. So, to sum it up in one sentence, you know, you're saved if you believe. Right? We know that. We're saved by grace through faith. You're saved if you believe. Therefore, you know you're saved because you believe. And it really is that simple. You know, we try and make it complicated and you know, false doctrine sometimes complicates things, but the truth really is that simple. You need to believe to be saved. So how do I know I'm saved? Well, it's because I've believed. That's how I know. It's not something else. It's, it's as simple as that.